All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation, CP the Franchise here. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. We got a great interview for us tonight, man. Joining me tonight, he is a recording artist and executive producer for Dreamville Records. Having worked with artists like Jada Kiss, Styles P, Drag On, uh, Joe Buttons, and of course his Dreamville label mates J. Cole, Ari Lennox, Boz, and, and many more. He goes by the name of Anthony Perino. But his mm-hmm. produ- his his industry name is Elite. That's so, me. Yeah, man, <laughs> Elite. How you doing, man? Thanks for joining the show. Oh uh, yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I've I've been watching the show. I guess I'm a little late. I know you've been doing it for a while. I started watching last year on and off, and then to be honest, this year I, I think I've watched almost every show. So I'll be in there, man. I'm I'm definitely a fan of the show. Man, definitely appreciate the support. Um, so me and you are around the same age. You know, take me back to we were just talking before we recorded about you know the posters in the background and stocks and whatnot. So take take me back to your your history, your days as a Knicks fan growing up. Yeah, my my story is kind of interesting, honestly. Like. Uh, I'm from Westchester. My dad um, was an art professor at SUNY Purchase College. And, you know, I was a little kid. And I remember one day, uh, you know, all the hardcore Knicks fans know that back in the 90s, the Knicks used to practice at SUNY yeah, Purchase, Purchase. Yep. College. Yeah. Yep. So um, one day my dad brought home a, uh, I guess they had like a team day, you know, and they had like um, all the teachers and stuff got to go in and get autographs or whatever. So he brought me home like a little picture of like the whole team and it was mm-hmm. signed by everybody. And, um, you know, I just thought, I guess I, I just thought it was cool. So I started watching the team. My dad kind of started like, you know, he wasn't really a basketball fan like mm-hmm. that, but it was just the fact that they practiced that purchase that it was, you know, kind of like a hometown thing. Yeah. He, you know, so I started getting into it and um, that was like 93 or 94. So it was a good time to kind of like start getting into it, you know, and then the whole like playoff run in 94. I mean, it was easily it captivated me, obviously, yeah. as it did pretty much everybody else around that time. And um, really what I used to do um, from then until like for the next like few years is. Uh, I would go to the gym and what they used to do, they had a, uh, a separator, a divider. It was three mm-hmm. courts and they had a divider where the one court, the main court had all the Knicks logos and colors and everything on it. Then they had a side court that was like, you know, reserved for the college players mm-hmm. or anybody. It was open to the college, basically. And I used to just stay on that college court and wait. Every mm. every time like I could like after school whenever I could be around I would just wait 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 for the players to come out and try to get my little autographs or whatever it was and um Anthony Mason was my favorite player man, because every time I asked him for an autograph he gave it to me and I probably asked him like fifteen times you know <laughs> like and he was the coolest guy man he was the coolest out of all of them so he was my favorite player and you know ever since then man I've just been a diehard like super I mean how could you not be you know what I mean yeah, just yeah. like. I was a diehard fan. I've been there through the uh, through all this terrible, <laughs> all these terrible years. But you know, my friends make fun of me for it sometimes because it's like, how can you watch this? Because every year it's just like it's over and over again. But I'm like, you don't understand, man. There's nothing that could happen that would like yeah. stop me from watching the games. Like I just have to, man. It's just in my blood at this point. Like we're, you know, stay loyal, man. You know, yeah, we're in it, man. We're in it to the end. So it is what it is, and. Um, you know, last year was the best. Obviously, I, I had a great time last year. It was like so exciting, and then unfortunately, this year has been a little bit of a letdown so far. But here we are. <laughs> yeah, no, no question, man. Last year was was definitely you know took us by surprise, and you know since not since that Knicks tape year with Melo and you know when we brought in Rashid and and uh, and Jason Kidd and Felton, you know that was the last time we really had a great time as a fan base just enjoying the ride of this team. So last year definitely was um, was a lot of fun, man. But you know what what's your thoughts on on how things are going right now at the time of this recording? They're twelve and 15, 27 games in. <laughs> yeah, what are you what are you thinking about the, the current state of affairs, man? It's tough, bro. It's like I feel like last year everything that went right for us could have that could have gone right for us went right, mm-hmm. and this year it's almost like the opposite. You know, it's like the worst case scenario so far. Because I really I was on the fifty burger team with y'all. You know, yeah, like yeah, I was yeah. like, hey man, Shout like out to JD. I, I thought fifty was was a possibility the way we started the year. You know, because mm-hmm. the the energy felt good. We came in, everyone was kind of clicking, and um, bro, it's just. 
I hate to blame it on one person, but right now it really starts with Randall, bro. That's mm-hmm. how I feel. You know, it's like he got to whatever funk he's going through, like he got to figure it out and get his spirits up. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I feel like someone like Fournier, for instance, right? He's new and I feel like he's the type of player who is going to feed off the team. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like if like in the beginning of the year, you saw that, like we kind of had some of that momentum from last year going. So he was playing good. And I feel yeah. like if the team is playing good, Fournier is going to play good. But it all starts with Randall, and I feel like something ain't right with him. And it's mental or it's emotional or whatever it is. And, um, you know, I think it just starts there, bro, because he's the engine. You know what I mean? And it's also, it's like, I mean, I I was watching your show today, and everybody pretty much said everything, you know what Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as the body language and everything. It's really that. I mean, it's it's as simple as that to me. I think everybody else is feeding off of that. Yeah. You know, everybody else is feeding off of that. So it's. I don't know, man. I hope he gets, I hope he figures it out. Yeah, I hope so too, man. You know, it, I I feel like it kind of just seems like there's a lot of pressure on him right now to, you know, recreate that success from last year. Obviously, he signed the big contract and, and he's the guy. So he has to know that it's all eyes on him. And it just seems like in certain games now, I, I, I like the fact that he's unselfish and, and really trying to get his guys going and in a rhythm. But at the same time, he has to be aware and understand that there's certain times where we need him to be aggressive and need him to be unselfish and, and you know, take better shots. And he, he's, yeah. he's passing up a lot of shots and turnovers, over thing, yeah, turning turnovers. the ball over seven turnovers against the Bucks. So uh, he, he's in a bad place right now. And obviously, that, you know, that, that impacts the team and the team's record. So we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, certainly encouraged by Quentin Grimes. You know, Quentin Grimes' play, 27 yeah. points a career high. Quentin Grimes has to play, man. There, there's no question. Yeah. Quentin Grimes has to get into the rotation. He's fun to watch, man, because he plays so hard, and his jump shot looks like like the release of his shot is so high. Like I feel like it's so, and, and I think they commented on it today during the game. It's like it's hard to close out on that shot. Like he yeah. really has a high release and a quick yeah. release. So as like a as like a catch and shoot player, and he shoots it fast. Like mm-hmm. every time he shoots the ball, he fires it up. Like I love that. You yeah. know, it's like he's not shy. He fires that ball up, and he plays hard. He plays defense. So I like Grimes, but um. Going back to Randall, one thing I want to just point out mm-hmm. that I feel is he kind of doesn't have the prettiest game, you know, to watch mm-hmm. as just like a viewer. But what I'll say is last year he played his ass off. I don't know if I can curse or not. Yeah, 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 good. <laughs> yeah, he, he played so hard that it was like you forgive some of the turnovers and some of like even like the last game like the, right. you know we know he's not the most clutch or whatever but like he plays he played so hard last year that you just kind of forgive that stuff you're like hey man we're rocking with him because he's playing so hard yeah. and i pinpoint that brooklyn game this year where he played so hard he didn't mm-hmm. succeed like mm-hmm. he had his shortcomings but you forgive it when he plays that hard because you're just like hey man he's out there giving it his all right and he's not doing that every game this year whereas he was last year he was just playing like his life depended on yeah, every, every game. game. Every he's game. not doing that this year, just to be honest. You know, he's not like so. And it's a lot to ask of somebody to play that hard every mm-hmm. night. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, but he's just that type of player where it's like if you don't go a hundred percent every night, it's gonna get look a little ugly sometimes. Yeah, you know? no, no question, man. Uh, did you go to many games like over the years at the Garden? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, Any, I wasn't a season ticket holder or anything, yeah. Um, but yeah, I make it to to my fair share. You know, it's been a minute because I'm on the West Coast now, so like, yeah, I can't remember the last. I went to a few last year, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's 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 been a minute. When Dennis was there, because you know Dennis is our guy. He, right. he went to and and Dotson too. That was my guy too. I'm old team I'm Dot. Sad, I'm sad. Yeah, I'm definitely team Dot, man. I'm sad that we we let him go, but like. Um, when we when they were on the squad, I was going to a bunch of games for sure. Yeah, you know, I, I was hoping things would have worked out with DSJ, you know, and, and that he would have fulfilled his potential here. It mm-hmm. just didn't work out, but it seemed like he, he's having a little bit of success with the Blazers, though. Definitely, he's been he's been stepping up, and his defense has really stepped up too, which I'm glad people are starting to notice because he's really playing he's playing some good defense. So yeah, yeah, man, yeah, absolutely, man. Shout out to DSJ. So let's get into your journey, man. You know, in the music industry as an artist and the producer, wh- when did that come about? Like, wh- when did you realize like this this was the the career path or you know the the path that you wanted to take? Yeah, well, just to be clear, now I'm I'm definitely hundred percent producer mode. I have mm. my little artist moment, but I'm definitely on the on the on the uh, behind the scenes stuff these mm-hmm. days, hundred percent. And like. 
Um, it started really, to be honest, like um, I went to school at Purchase, like as my dad worked. It really came from my dad. My dad was a, was an artist, and he mm-hmm. was like kind of encouraging me. Like he used to see me just kind of like you know do my thing on the computer. And like mm-hmm. I was like real heavy on the internet when I was young, and like. Um, making beats, learning how to make beats and stuff. And he just encouraged me because he was creative too, you know? So mm. he would just encourage me to do it and um, encourage me to go to school to SUNY Purchase for it because uh, they have a music program. So I went there uh, for music and um, I did a summer, a study abroad in Spain, mm. uh, took a music course out there. And I, and one of the other students in my class, um, her name was Alima Dean. She was Dean Wah's sister, who, if you know Rough Riders, Dean Wah is the, were the CEOs and founders of Rough Riders. She was their little sister, and she was going to school, for, same like me, just trying to get into music and, and learn and everything. Mm-hmm. So we became friends there. She kind of saw that I would, had a little bit of talent or whatever, and she became my manager, got me an internship at Rough Riders uh, mm-hmm. Powerhouse Studios. Uh, this is like, you know, 2000, around you know 2001 maybe mm-hmm. and um i just was in there like you know cleaning up after everybody going on store runs and doing <laughs> all the dirty work and um you know i didn't really push my beats on anybody i kind of just did my job and stayed quiet you know mm-hmm. and then came cool with people and one day you know the word got around that i made beats from however and um i actually played or i gave a beat cd to um ice pick j who was a um an a and r for rough riders he actually um passed away a few years ago mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um but a great guy man he heard my 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 beats he, he 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 saw my potential and he played it for drag on and um drag on uh got on um one of my beats and it was in the cradle to the grave soundtrack and that kind of like i was young man i was like you know 19 at this point and yeah. it kind of like started everything from there and um and yeah that was the beginning basically that's what's up. So you remember what you were thinking as a 19 year old to know that, you know, a track that you made is now in a movie soundtrack. You were one of yeah. the hottest labels at the time. You know, Drag On was definitely doing his thing at that time. Like, what, what were you thinking as a young 19 year old just, just trying to come up in the game? Man, it's interesting because there's a little bit of like, uh, just to be honest, do you have a little bit of like a golden child complex, right? Because you think, oh, I just started like I'm the man, you know, mm-hmm. like this mm-hmm. is like meant for me so i was definitely very confident but that was quickly followed by a reality check which i think Mm. happens to a lot of people where you kind of realize like i don't really know what i'm doing you know what i mean Mm. like and that took me some time to get past because you can have a little bit of success but at the end of the day you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna find out real soon like in anything that is consistency wins out you know so Mm. um i had to really put in a lot of work um to get to a point where I felt like I was deserving and belonging to be and to do what I was doing at the time. You know what I mean? So it was a, it was a gift and a curse because, you know, to have success so fast like that, you know, it's exciting and it definitely encourages you to go harder because Mm -hmm. you're like, Oh, like, you know, people think I'm good. So I must, I got to start It encourage you to keep going. But then Mm -hmm. you definitely have those moments. I had those moments where I was looking around, like, I don't belong here. Like, what am I, what Mm -hmm. am I doing here? You know, like, Everybody else has been doing this for a long time and I'm new. So I just tried to really soak it up. I was very quiet, you know, back in, in those times, obviously. Like mm-hmm. I was just a fly on the wall. I was trying to listen and learn. If if I had a, if I produced a song, we went in to mix the record. I was there early. I was asking the engineer all the questions I could. Like I was just trying to be a sponge and, and, and learn as much as I could, you know. Styles P and Jadakiss, two two of my favorite rappers of all time styles is my favorite rapper of all time you know ne- oh, next nice. next next to the pantheon of you know hove and, and, yeah. and nas and that's big a great favorite man it's like anthony mason being your favorite styles. it's like it's very similar hey you know what i love about styles is to this day he's still hungry man I- i'm bumping this the styles and havoc project right now love oh, yeah. styles man a- absolutely love he styles. so much quality man. yeah still yeah and, and let me tell you man when i first heard shootouts i think I, it was on a big mic mixtape and I, I was yeah. going to Hampton at the time. I had a, a 96 act legend, like a sea green act legend. You couldn't tell me nothing, man. I, I was killing everybody <laughs> over there. Couldn't t- couldn't tell me nothing. When I first heard shootouts on that big mic tape, bro, I kid you not. I used to shake down the whole, I used to live in an apartment complex across from the school. I used to shake down the whole neighborhood playing that thing. All four windows down would just be me driving, lean oh, all man. the way back in the car. 
Yeah, <laughs> let me tell you, because that that classic Styles and Jada in and out flow, it, that 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 song took me back, man. I, I love that. I love that beat, bro. Love that Appreciate beat. Appreciate it, man. That was one of my like, you know, that was like the big. Even though the drag on thing was a big, like it was like the first thing. Yeah, that was like the first like. Oh, like you know what I mean? Like where it was like I felt I you could feel the energy. Like this is a song that people really yeah, like. You yeah. Know? And I, I'll never forget. I had a Honda Accord at the time, mm-hmm. and I remember when Funk Flex started his show with it, and he brought it back like a whole bunch of times. And I was <laughs> in in my apartment complex in the parking lot in my Honda Accord, blasting it. Just like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Like that, that was a moment, man. That was a moment. That was a crazy. That was a. Whew, that that song took a lot of work too. I'm yeah, not gonna lie. It took a lot of work on that song, but I, it was a it was a blessing. And to this day, like you know, now I work with Cole and everybody, and mm-hmm. like you know, people will find out that I did that song, and they'll be like, "What? You did that song?" Like it's kind of like one of those little like um, feathers in my cap that I'm very proud of. That like people like can't believe, like, "Oh, you did that? It don't even make sense." Like now you look at my discography, I'm like, you know, Ari Lennox, R&B, all this other stuff. Yeah, but yeah. like. I kind of got that little nice little bullet in the chamber, like you know, I'm I'm appreciative of that one for sure. Fire, 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 bro! What is what's like that creative process for you? Like, what is it? What is what goes into making a beat um, from from your perspective? Um, man, you just got it's so many similarities to basketball. Like, you just got to put shots up, you know. Like, you just gotta mm. you just gotta get in there and. Um, I think it's something honestly that I took from Cole because he he takes this mentality where it's like, you know, you you gotta be consistent and you gotta you gotta you gotta put the hours in. It's the only way, you know. Mm-hmm. And I look at it like I, I do look at it like basketball, where it's like there's the off season, there's practice, and then there's also the game. To me, the game is when you're in the studio with an artist sitting next to you. That's the game, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But all the time that you're in your in your house by yourself or in your studio by yourself, that's practice. And I treat it, I, I kind of separate the two where it's like mm-hmm. when I'm by myself, I'm trying to sharpen my skills and prepare so that I have everything I need, samples, sounds, mm-hmm. like um, inspiration, everything like at my fingertips so that when I get with an artist, I have everything set out and it's like, I don't need to be inspired because I already stockpiled so much stuff from putting in all the hours before that moment, you know? Yeah. So I try to just be as prepared as possible and put in, you know, you just got to put in as many hours as you can um, getting up there now. So, you know, I got a family and everything, so I have to yeah, balance yeah. it. But it's like when I was younger, I mean, I was, I was, I was obsessive about it. And I think when you put in the hours, um, it kind of like, you know, as, as the years go on, you can, you start building tricks, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you start having the little fade away that you can go to and like, yeah. the, you know, yeah, the little yeah, things yeah. that you, that you get in your bag and yeah, you, you, you know, so I, I think I've developed a few tricks, but I'm also always trying to just grow and like push myself and learn stuff and watch the YouTube tutorials and, and, uh, you know, figure out new, new, new tricks. Yeah. It's this to stay fresh. I, I hear that, man. It yeah. was there a particular genre of music that, that you typically like lean on in terms of your samples. Yeah, soul for sure. Soul seventies soul mm-hmm. is my favorite. You know, it's always like it's, it's the it's the easy kind of go to. I just love the the instrumentation and the musicianship from that era. Like mm-hmm. it was like, you know, it was like the height of 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 real like actual hands on recording to tape live performance. Mm-hmm. So you had the best of the best musicians. Yeah, yeah. Before stuff started to turn digital and synthesizer in the eighties, and that was the kind of the crossover but in the se- late 70s was like the height of like pure musicianship i feel like you know so i always like to listen to that and listen to like the classic kind of just um guitar roads ba- live bass mm-hmm. um piano strings like the real instruments you know like i like that stuff personally as far as just textures are concerned um more than like the synthy um computerized stuff but i get into that stuff too but yeah. my favorite is definitely like that 70s soul stuff uh, who were some of your, your musical inspirations like your artists oh uh, well you know when i was a kid it was all michael jackson for me that was like the the god you know and it was mm-hmm. like i was just obsessed um i i don't i think i went through like a a, a four-year phase where i like I, I i literally would not listen to anything if it was not michael jackson <laughs> jackson five the yeah, jacksons yeah. Janet Jackson might sneak be sneak in there like yeah, it had yeah. to be Jackson related. So I was definitely heavy on that. Um, but then you know when I when I got into like high school and stuff, I was like super hip hop head. Like um, 
Outcast, um, The Locks, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, like the the typical Mount Rushmore that everybody else has, mm-hmm. Nas and Jay and everyone else. Um, but I think Outcast was big for me in college too. Like I started like when the Love Below came out, mm-hmm, that was like mm-hmm. a big moment for me. You know, like as far as just like pushing the boundaries and like yeah. kind of blending hip hop and like and the and, the, and it even had some seventies soul kind of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. stuff wrapped up in there. And he was singing and doing different stuff and had some prints in there too. It felt like that was a big album for me. Um, so Andre is one of my favorites, and then. Um, and yeah, man, I guess I could go on and on, but that's a for sure, for a, sure. Yeah. Um, g- closing off your Rough Riders tenure, you know, in 07, you you went on tour with, with DMX. We lost DMX yeah. this past year, man. Rest in peace to yeah. X. What, what was that experience like? Man, it's crazy, man. What a crazy time. Um, I had like a I had like a in between period between working with Rough Riders and working with J Cole, where I was like things were slow for me, you know, and Mm. like I had a regular job. I was working at like a psych ward at at a hospital, you know, like Mm. I was just like trying to find doing temp work, doing anything I could. And I was uh, I got that placement, a placement on the DMX album Year of the Dog um, with Bizarre Royale, who was an artist signed to Bloodline, Mm. which was DMX's label. And me and Bizarre became like good friends, like just from that song, we started like hanging out and stuff. And he was opening for X on that tour. Mm. And he just invited me. Like, he's like, you want to come on tour? So I just dropped everything. I quit my job. I was like, hey, man, I, this might be the last, like, hurrah. You know, like, I might as well just go. So yeah. it was a lot of nights sleeping on hotel floors. And, like, we were in, like, this, like, rusty old van. Because I wasn't with X. I was with Bizarre, you know? <laughs> yeah, so right. It was right. like, I was on the B squad, you right, know? Right. We were, like, we were thugging it out on that on that trip. Mm. Um but it was a great experience. I mean, being around X was like a movie. I mean, the guy was, I mean, he was amazing, man. So the biggest takeaway I have from X was every single fan that that approached him. First of all, the type of people who were approaching him, the energy that they would give him was mm. different. Like, it was like, you could tell when people saw him, they were just like so genuinely thankful and appreciative of him. And mm. they showed that to him. And I think he he soaked it up and like he was so present with every person who approached him, which is pretty cool because he got approached a lot. You know what I mean? But Mm -hmm. he made it like a point. I could tell like he was making it a point to be present, look people in their eyes, really hear what they had to say and give that energy back. I thought that was like, that was, that was pretty special, you know, because he got approached a lot, you know, (laughs) so it's like, it's not easy to, to keep, to keep giving your yourself to people like that, but he did it, you know, he really did it. So that was cool. You said, you know, it was a struggle, a bit of a time off, a bit of a lag between, you know, the Rough Rider stint and, and meeting J. Cole. In yeah. between that time, did you feel like abandoning that dream? Did you feel like, you know, I'm, I got to do something else? Like, this just ain't working out? Like, where, where were you mentally during that time? I, I don't know if I felt like I got to do something else, but I definitely felt like I don't like doing this. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I was not, it wasn't working, so it was frustrating so like i started to develop like a bit of like a block towards it because it was like you know it just felt started to feel like homework instead of feeling like fun you know and i mm. think once you start feeling that way about anything that you do it's not good you yeah, know yeah. um but thankfully um you know meeting well working with cole closer um was i was able to rediscover the fun in it you know what i mean because um that was just like a refresh that I desperately needed at that time, you know, for sure. Uh, Talk about how you and J Cole connected. Yeah. So we were, uh, actually me and Cole became friends while I was working with rough riders because we were both kind of like hip hop nerds and we were like online in the message boards. And he, uh, he reached out to me. I think I was posting about like that. I was working with rough riders or whatever it was. Mm. And he reached out to me and, um, was just like, you know, like, yo, you got to hear my shit. Like, and, and, sorry, but at that time, um, it wasn't like now where you have 100 SoundCloud links in your DMs, even if you don't do rap. Right, right. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It was kind of like it was a, it was it caught my attention that someone was sending me some music, you know. So mm. um, he sent me a song that he did. It's called The Storm. You can find it online now. Um, it was he was like 15 at the time. It was the first song he ever recorded. And I mean. For a 15-year-old, you go listen to that song now, you could tell instantly, like, oh, this kid is special, you know. So 
I just started talking to him a lot online. We would send music back and forth and he lived in Carolina, but he was planning to go to St. John's. So when he came to visit St. John's, Mm -hmm. we actually met up at a Burger King in Times Square (laughs) and like had like a rap cypher outside. (laughs) And like, we just was cool ever since then, you know, like we just kept working. And then when it came time, actually when he did the come up, I was on tour with DMX. When I came back, he started working on the warm up. And he recorded a bunch of it at my house. Like we were in just like in, in, in my room in my closet. I had like a little, you know, rinky dink set up in my mm-hmm. closet. And um that was just we just was just from there. I, I think there was a point when I realized like, all right, like I need to focus on this. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I need to just be around as much as possible and, and, and work with him as much as I can and and that was it. That, that's what's up, man. So What's like, you know, that creative process, like when you're working with different artists, you know, you've worked with Drag On and then Kiss and Styles and and now you're working with Cole. Um, how do you kind of just, just match that vibe? Is it something where you're just making different beats all the time and, and they just, you know, pick and choose what they want or are they coming to you with a with concept? Well, specifically with Cole, is, is he coming to you with a concept and then you're kind of, you know, crafting that beat based on that? Yeah, you know, it's always different. And it's like, you kind of just have to be adaptable, right? Like, you kind of have to be ready for anything. And in the beginning, like, with Rough Riders, it was just, I was making beat CDs, Mm -hmm. and I was quiet, you know? So I was like, I was almost had to build the courage to walk up to styles and be like i have a beat cd for you you know like so that was a different thing that was it i was giving them the beat cd and hoping something would happen Mm -hmm. you know because i was young i was not like it was that was it but with cole it was more so like we were able to be in the same room create together and like it's a different thing you know but cole also produces so he knows what he wants you know he's very quick like I could be making a beat and he'll be like, I don't like that snare. Mm. And I have to like find a new one, you know, whatever it is. So I learned working with him to adapt on the fly and also work faster um, because he works fast. And you also just realize like when you're alone, you might go through a million sounds and take an hour to do whatever. But when you're with an artist, they don't want to sit there and mm. wait for you to figure it out. You know, yeah, like they yeah. want to get the vibe going. So I had to get faster. And um, now I can make beats very fast. But like at the, in the beginning, no, like it took me a long time. So you got to be fast. You got to have you got to be prepared. You know what I mean? You yeah. got to be prepared for anything. Uh, Cole likes to do this thing. We did this the other day where he'll go around the room and like kind of give you an assignment and time you. And he'll be like 90 seconds. Like I want you to you got three sounds. The tempo is 90 BPM. Go. I'm like, you just got to scramble to make it happen. But yeah. sometimes something crazy comes out of it because it's like. You're not thinking. You're just going. You know what I mean? Right. So he, he's different. You know, he's got all types of drills and, and different <laughs> types of stuff that he throws at us. And it's like, it keeps it fun, you know? Yeah. Now, that's interesting, man. But to be great, you, you, I guess you got to do those things. It's a very interesting, uh, very interesting dynamic indeed. So, yeah. you know, it, it's so funny, like, b- before his albums drop, how do you, when, you, when you're on the internet and, and you see in the chatter... And people say, oh, he's not making no music or when it's the next Cole album drop. But in the backdrop, you know, you working on on a banger. Like, how you know, how do you re- react to that? Well, it's funny because I remember I used to see some of that stuff and always think like people have no idea how much music he makes. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's insane. You know, like it, the output is crazy. Like mm-hmm. he is a hard worker. So it's not like he takes years off and just hangs out or goes to the beach you know what i mean like he's in the studio constantly so it's just a matter of like you know he's a he's he's a concept driven artist so Mm -hmm. he gotta find what he wants to say with each project that takes some time sometimes you might make a bunch of songs and then say all right well what's the direction here what's my next thesis you Mm -hmm. know what i mean Mm -hmm. like what am i going towards with this next next project so that might take some some time but i always know like he's a quality over quantity artist and these days he was kind of on like the 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 edge of when that was able to even work you know now it's hard like it's hard to be quality over quantity like you got to have you got to have qu- quantity now you know because our attention spans and you know you're a content creator like yeah, you got to yeah. keep it coming you know like mm-hmm. or else people forget so he um but he has the luxury now of course he's you know a big star so he can kind of just when he's inspired and it's ready he can put it out but all I have to say is that it's not like he just takes time off and and doesn't. He's always in the studio, you mm. know. And the amount of songs he has is, is insane. Like I've got 
me and him have songs together that I know will never come out. And, and every time we do a song, it's almost like you got to just, I, I don't even get excited anymore because I'm like, there's, you know, a 10% chance this will see the light of day yeah, because yeah. he just does so much stuff, you know? Do you feel pressure to to top each project? You know, when each project comes out and 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 the fans are rallying around it, and and this this is a classic, this is that. You know, how yeah. do you as a producer get get ready for the next one? You know, knowing that that last one was, was there was such you know a high ex- level of expectations. Yeah, it's a thing. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna lie and say it doesn't exist in your mind somewhere, but you can't focus. It, you get into trouble when you focus on it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like. You got to just you got to just do the work and and, and, and 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 put your head down and do the drills, you know, like you got to just get in the gym or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah, you, gotta, you know, like, but it does exist, of course. You know, we are human. Like, so like even like with I, I, I produced a majority of, of Ari Lennox first album, the, the Shea Butter Baby, and we're working on her second album now. Mm-hmm. And we feel like that first album was great and we're so proud of it. And it's like, yeah, we got to top it now. Or we, you know what I mean? Like, right. or we at least have to match the quality level of it and hope that it does better. You know what I mean? The next time around, of course that exists in your mind, but you can't focus on it too much or else it's going to make you make bad decisions because mm. you don't want to make decisions based on that. You know what I mean? You kind of have, to, or else you, it's going to sound forced or contrived. You know what I mean? Mm. You have to just, focus on the music and um tune that out but it's there you know it's yeah. def- you have to battle it kind of you know you you were nominated for a grammy for uh the return of dreamville album what, what yes. did that what did that mean to you to to have that nomination you know it's it was dope it's funny the grammys are a funny thing because it's like there were so many times when i thought we were going to be nominated and mm-hmm. we weren't you know, like Crooked Smile. I was like, oh, we're getting a Grammy for this. Like yeah. we had it on, the, we wrote it on the wall. Like that was like a big, and then it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And then it was For Your Eyes Only. And I was like, oh, we're getting a Grammy for this. And then mm-hmm. it didn't happen. And then when that one came, it was almost just like, you're like, all right, cool. You know, like you almost felt like uh, I was appreciative, but it was like, I don't know, man. I, I feel like I'm almost jaded at this point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Where it's like the Grammys is something that it's just like, they're always a little late on people you know mm, what i mean mm, like and it's mm. like they come around when it's like the train has already left and everything and it's like you know i'm not gonna lie and say i don't want one because i do <laughs> want one <laughs> i do want one yeah but you know you get a little jaded by doing so much stuff and then it's like oh i thought this was gonna be it and then it's not whatever so it was dope but like i guess i have i want to have it in a certain way you know what i mean where yeah. it's like i want it to be um like if Ari would have been nominated for Shea Butter Baby, another one where I would have been like, I would have been hyped. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. Green Book thing was fire because it was like as a collective, like so many people had a hand in that. That's what I really liked about that mm-hmm. was that so many people got a Grammy nomination for that because so many producers and artists were on that album. You know what I mean? Like first mm-hmm. time nominations. So many people got their first time nominations off that album. So that was really cool. Um so yeah, that was dope. Yeah, that's dope. From you know the, a collective effort and and everybody getting their name on that. Or you yeah. know, what did you make of the news when when Drake took his name out of uh, consideration for the for for the Grammy nominations this year? That's interesting, man. That's interesting. I mean, like I just said, you know, I've felt I felt definitely let down before about mm-hmm. you know, but that's life, man. You know, <laughs> like that's life. It's like sometimes you have goals and you don't quite get there, but you know, it's like. I understand, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't know what went into his decision all the way, you know what I mean? But yeah. I get it, you know, because it's like he probably felt like not just him, I'm assuming because I don't know, but I'm assuming he's mm-hmm. not just making that stand for him and his music, but he sees it happening to a lot of artists, especially in hip hop, where it's like, you know, deserving um, stuff ain't right. You know, we mm-hmm. know the stuff ain't, it ain't all the way right with the mm-hmm. Grammys and like the politics behind the scenes and just whatever it is. So I understand. I think he's coming from it from, I would think he was coming from it from a broader, trying to make a statement on a broader scale, more mm-hmm. so than just his music, you know, cause he gets some Grammy nominations. Yeah. It's not like he don't get nominated. I think he's trying to probably stand up for the people who he feels deserve it and don't, and don't get it. You know, do you look back, you know, ba- based on all the accomplishments that, that you and Dreamville um, ha- have achieved you, you, that, that you guys have realized over the years, you know, the, the platinum plaques, the gold plaques, and the success with Ari Lennox, obviously Cole uh, being a powerhouse. Do you look back at that time when, 
you know, you, you had doubts in, in between the, the Rough Riders and, and meeting Cole and just looking at where you are right now? Yeah, for sure, man. That's always the humbling thing, you know, is like when you think about um, sometimes whenever you zoom out, you know, like and you just look at the whole thing, it always it always makes you feel grateful, you know, because uh, sometimes we get focused on like these little things. Like I was just talking about these Grammys and these little things. It's like it doesn't matter because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, when I started, my real goal was like, I want to do this for a living because I love doing this mm-hmm. and I'm able to do that now. So it's like you have to zoom out and just be appreciative. Like, wow, I'm living my dream. You know what I mean? Like as as you're doing right now yourself, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like you're just on WFAN. Like yeah. that's amazing. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's similar. It's just like, you just got to be grateful. Like, damn, like I might, I might have little particular things that I, well, I wish this went this way or yesterday. I didn't, this beat that I made, I didn't get the response that I wanted. Mm-hmm. Ah, you get frustrated. But when you zoom out, it's always like you got to be appreciative, you know, because things are go- things have been pretty good. Is there an artist on your bucket list that, that you want to work with? Man, so, so many. But mm-hmm. like, it's always like the, the people that everybody says, yeah, you know, like yeah. Andre, Frank Ocean would be amazing. I'm a mm-hmm. fan of his. Um, dang, uh, there's so many, man. Um, Andre's the big one. You yeah. know, Andre 3000. Everybody wants the first from Andre 3000, right? Like, it's just like, that's the, that's the, that's the big one. Um, if I had to choose one. <laughs> Yeah, but no. it's just generic because everybody says that. But he's the best to me. Like, he's one of the best, you know, and he's my favorite. So, uh, and he's also so elusive. Like he's never anywhere, you oh, know. So yo. it's like that's yeah. what makes everyone want him to to work with him even more. Yo, the f- funny funny that you say that, man. Because last year I'm on the way to my nine to five, and I and I work down by by um financial district, and it's like yeah. eight thirty in the morning, just like a random Tuesday in New York City, and I'm just walking. I I get off the train in Fulton Street, and get out the subway. I'm just walking and I see Andre 3000 on the corner, like just just a ran, random, random Andre 3000 yeah, sighting. No flute, no flute. But like by the time <laughs> I turn around and double check, he was gone. Yeah, and, and that, that I, I kid you not, I'm he was gone, man. He was it was definitely 3000. By the time I turn around, gone, man. Vanished That's without amazing. trace, man. Uh, yeah. When we were on tour somewhere, like in Germany or some random place, and like. Some of the people who were on tour with us like came back from like a Chinese restaurant. We're like, "Yo, Andre 3000 at the Chinese <laughs> restaurant in like in like Berlin or wherever we were." Yeah, and I was like, "What? Like, it's, he's out there, man. He's yeah, just roaming the planet, like the, enjoying his life. Just enjoying it. Just enjoying <laughs> it, man. Shout out to 3000, yeah. man. Definitely one of the one of the goats, man. Um, so you know, I, I come across a, a lot of producers, a, a lot of guys want to send me beats, and obviously it's, it's a competitive field. Everybody wants to 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 be in your shoes, man. What what advice would you give to those aspiring producers and, and creators out there? Oh man, um, I always I'm always like of the belief of like, you know, focus on what you can control and don't worry about like. A lot of people are like, how do I get my name out there or how do I get my music out there? And I always kind of feel like I've been there too, where I felt that way, right? But mm-hmm. I always recognize that when i put energy into that it doesn't really do anything Mm. but when i put energy in and this not this doesn't apply to everybody because some people do go that route where they Mm. go out on you know flood everyone's dms Mm. and do whatever they do and it works for them but for me i've always found that when i like let's just say i start a schedule for myself every day and i stick to it i'm like i'm making five beats a day i'm practicing my piano scales i'm organizing my sounds i'm the, i'm watching youtube tutorials every day like when i commit to, to working every day mm-hmm. the shit just happens you know what i mean like stuff starts to come to you and it's mm-hmm. like you just got to stir the pot you know what i mean like you got to work at, at what you can work on so I, I that's what i believe and i've always told people like just work on getting good so that when you do have a miraculous opportunity pop up, you're ready for it. You know yeah, what I mean? Don't yeah. go searching an opportunity and you're not even ready for it. Like, be, make yourself ready so when the opportunity comes, you're good. You, you want to be good. You know, yeah. you got to stand out. So so spend time on your craft and and, and, and just and then also build confidence. And people can smell confidence. Like, if, if you're approaching somebody and you really ain't that confident because you haven't put the work in, they're going to sense that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Um, that would be my advice is just to focus on 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 getting good at what you do 
first and foremost, you know? Well, well said, man. All right, these last few questions, we're going to go rapid fire, man. Rapid yeah, fire. Yeah, another rapid fire. Rapid fire with, <laughs> with the Elite. All right, you, you mentioned Mace was your favorite player. Give me your top five Knicks that that you've seen, your favorite Knicks. And it, it doesn't have to be the greatest favorite. of all time. Your top five favorite Knicks that you've seen, or maybe your starting five that, that you've seen. Just favorite, not like. Yeah, favorite. Next. Favorite. Okay, Anthony Mason got to be there. Yeah. So, uh, so what, you put Mason at the three, the four? Where are you putting Mason in your, in your lineup? Well, I mean, I feel like the only thing Mason could play now is the four. I don't think he can play the three now, so we're going to have to put him at the four. Okay. <laughs> we're going to put him at the four. Mason, got to go Ewing. I mean, you yeah. know, I love Ewing. And he's just like, he's like, I don't know. What can you say, right? So yeah. I'll put Ewing. I'm going to give it up to Mellow Man at the three. Mm-hmm. You know, Mellow gets a bad rap. I love Melo. I think he he came in. He came when no one wanted to come. I, I, I always got love for Melo. I agree I'm gonna with go, that. I'm going to go Spreewell at the two. Okay. Um, I was so hyped when Spreewell came. Um, at the one. Man, I'm tempted to. I'm tempted to say Marbury, man. I really liked Marbury. Like, he got yeah. a little crazy at the end. But yeah. what, I loved Marbury before he was a Nick. Yeah. Like, I don't know what it was. I just thought he was like. He was just so fun to watch, and when he came to the Knicks, I was so hyped. It didn't work oh, out. I was hyped, man. I was but so was hyped, of, bro. Yeah, me too, so man. Hyped. He was one of my favorites at the time. You know, he kind of let me down a little bit. But rapid fire, that's the first one I think of. So I'm going to go, go Marbury, yeah. Steph, Spree, Mello, Mace, Ewan. I, I like that lineup. I, I definitely yeah. like that lineup. Canby got to be in there. Canby's one of my favorites, too. So right. I'll have to put Canby maybe because six man, Six right? man. All right, six man <laughs> yeah. Marcus Canby. Marcus yeah. Canby. All right, no doubt. Um. <laughs> Top five favorite producers? Uh, Timberland, number one, easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alchemist. I'm a big Alchemist fan. Um, that Alchemist Green or, Ghost Project, still one of my favorites, man. Yeah. Uh, DJ Premier. Mm-hmm. Kanye. Early Kanye. Mm-hmm. Um, man, there's so many. Uh, and I, wait, how many, how many was that? Four or three? That was, uh, you said Timberland. Three. Yeah, no, you said Timberland, Kanye, uh, Primo, Alchemist. That was four. Okay, so that's four. So five. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm gonna go Just Blaze. Oh, I was about to say, so, okay, all right, no yeah, doubt, no Just doubt. Blade. Um, right. top five favorite beats. Oh man, that's that's probably a, that's probably a tough. It's gonna one. be hard. Yeah. yeah, I could maybe let me think though. Yeah, we gonna make it. Oh, cool. Okay, okay. You know, I had a list too. I made a list recently mm-hmm. um, of my favorite beats. We gonna make it. Uh, oh, um, Pony, Genuine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That beat. It was. I don't think people understand how, how that beat changed the game. Um, that beat was crazy. Uh, Timberland. Um, man, I could just list so many Timberland beats. Um, uh, no diggity. That's a beat that I always thought was like perfect. Um, Black Street, Dr. Mm-hmm. Dre. Uh, man, so many. Um, uh, damn, I had a list too. I wish I had it, but we gonna make it. Um, the message by Nas. Mm-hmm, I love mm-hmm. the beat. Uh, and I'm trying to think of like an Outcast one that I really, I really love. But I can't think of it off the top. Which one I'm gonna go with? I don't know. Um, because for me, Outcast it's it's the songs too, you know. Yeah. Um, dang. Oh, Spodio D- Dopalicious. I'm gonna go okay. with that one. All right, yeah. all right. <laughs> uh, best city to go on tour. Toronto. T dot. Yeah. 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 Toronto. Is, I love Toronto. I like. I love Toronto, man. I, I got yeah. a lot of family out there. Great city. Absolute great. City. It's, it's like it's, it's the New York of the North, man. It is. It is. And it's just a little more calm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody's laid it's back more, and chill. It's, and... Speed. it's just that like it's so cold, man. If it wasn't like yeah. 10 degrees colder than New York, I mean, I might have moved there, to be honest. I really like it. But it's too cold, bro. It's too cold. And New York yeah. is already too cold. I mean, you saw, I moved to L.A., so. <laughs> you did. <didn't laughs> moved to L.A. West. Yeah, Toronto is even colder, but it's a great city. I, yeah. I, I, time I go there, I, I enjoy it. No, no, no question, man. Well, well, listen, I, I love this session. I, I definitely uh, appreciate the time. Uh, you want to let the fans know what you're working on and any, anything upcoming that you want to promote? I'll just working. Right now, we're, I'm focused on um, Ari Lennox's second, um, second album, all the Dreamville stuff. Um, just 
think Kaz just I just came out with a song with Kaz I produced it's called Cry. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, man, check it out. All the Dreamville stuff, you know, we're coming. <laughs> yeah, you, you and Boz might have to do a new Knicks tape anthem, man. Yeah, I know, man. I know we need one. Um, here's a little fun fact. I did like a little song in like 2013 mm-hmm. um, season when we had like Camby and Mello and Jason Kidd, and Cole actually is on the on the he he was he was heavy into the Knicks at that time mm-hmm. too because we were so it was so popping and he actually is on the background vocals of that song. Oh, yeah. that nobody knows, yeah. <laughs> The glory days, not a nigga back, that's a Marby's phrase in the garden blaze of Pablo and Raymond. Might as well call call my the savior. Hard as pain the came on, don't play with coming to the paint, pray to God that you ain't hit. Chandler with the hoops, trying to add another banner hanging from the roof. JR with the step back, mega nets. He just did it, he just jumped on it and like did like some singing part in the background because I sent it to him. He's like, This is fire. And he did some background vocals. I didn't like put anything, I yeah. didn't want to like blow it up. And, like, you know, it was just a little thing. But it's a cool fact that Cole has some vocals on my little Knicks tape anthem. <laughs> might, might need to remix it, man. And, and I saw yeah. Cole on, uh, on on Jamal Crawford and Quentin Richardson's show last week on Hooper Vision. He was bigging up the Knicks as well. So um, yeah, he's always been a he's always been like a a, a Knicks. I want to say a fan, but like a supporter. Yeah, he was a big fan because he was a Penny Hardaway fan. Me too. And when too. when Penny was a Nick, he was like you know heavy. Yeah, uh, riding with the Knicks. So he he's always kind of like a. A secondary like supporter of the Knicks, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Pe- you know, Penny was my favorite player. I think I was I was equally as happy that Penny got traded to the Knicks, even though he was washed at the time yeah. when he came with Marbury. I was equally as happy when both of them came. Obviously, you know, it didn't work out that way. But um, like That's I an said, exciting I, trade though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Trade. But yeah, Elite Man, definitely appreciate all the support on the channel. Next phase, you got to call into the show, bro. You got to call in, man. Now that I'm on the Discord, taught me how to do the Discord because I got I got Discord and I'm on. I be in the chat sometimes, but like now that I know how to um how to call in, I'm a call in because I watch. Usually, to be honest, I usually watch recorded, so I gotta catch it live. You know what I mean? Because I usually like when I I watch like the next morning or something. You know what I mean? But like I gotta catch one live and I'll call in for sure. Yeah, much appreciated, man. Much success to you, and, and thanks again for the time. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. All right, man. Take it easy. <laughs>